Hi, everybody. Welcome to episode 84 of Radio 815, the podcast dedicated to examining the work of writer, director, producer J.J. Abrams and the extended Bad Robot universe. I am Matt Crandall here, as always, with my co host Marcelo Inostroza as we continue our rewatch of Fringe season one. Today, we are going to be talking about episodes 12 and 13. The first episode up is entitled The No Brainer. It aired January 27th, 2009, written by David H. Goodman, Brad Caleb Kane, directed by John Paulson. Marcelo, it only took us 12 episodes to get our first Dawson's Creek reunion on Fringe. What did you think of the no-brainer where Mary Beth Peel, famously known as Grams, shows up and has a couple of scenes with our dude, Peter Pacey Witter Bishop. That was absolutely delightful. Um, it took me a minute to place her face, but the minute she started talking, I was like, that's Grams. That was really, really delightful. The one thing that I really enjoyed about this episode is the subtext in which Grams, or that's what we're going to call her for the like this episode because I can't remember her character name. I really like the subplot in this episode or the whole reason why she shows up in the first place, because she wants to find out what the last moments of her daughter's life were like. And her daughter was the lab assistant that worked with Walter before he got locked up in St. Clair's. Peter's reluctance of letting Grams see Walter because he's afraid that it could, you know, offset his personality and he could, you know, he could like go mad or he could hurt her or who knows what kind of memories that that could bring up for him. I really liked Peter's insistency to not let Grams see Walter. Olivia basically said, you're underestimating Walter and he can handle more than you think. And I really think that that really rings true with certain family members who are overprotective of people in their household. You know, uh, you know, because they have mental problems or because they're disabled or what have you. So I really liked that subplot. That subplot really worked for me. Yeah, the Walter... Peter Graham's subplot of this episode is really well done. And it does start off with Peter noticing this letter and he reads it, throws it away. Astrid fishes it out of the trash. And we realize that, yeah, Walter, when he went away to St. Clair's 20 years ago, because of this incident that happened was like the final straw that broke the camel's back which we learn, you know, is this this lab fire and his assistant did die. So Grams at first Peter is worried because he feels like she just wants to yell and confront Walter because she believes he is responsible for her daughter's death. And as the episode goes on and Olivia says no you you don't need to protect him from this. In fact, it might even be a good thing. By the end of it, when Walter and Grams do have their meeting, it is much sweeter, and it's not uh, an expression of anger, but more like their collective grief together, and they find a way to, to kind of hash it out. And instead of yelling at Walter, she just wants to know more about her daughter's final moments and her final days. And Walter says, I will tell you everything I remember about her. And it's one of those moments where right before we're worried that Walter might not remember because Walter's memory is so spotty or he might say a Walterism and set this woman off. But it is one of those sweet moments that this whole plot runs through the episode, but culminates right near the end with that really sweet scene and it's adding layers to Walter and making him more empathetic, even while acknowledging the terrible things that have happened and that are a result of his work. I also like how that story thread connects the main story thread of the son protecting the father, who is basically making scrambled eggs out of everyone who 
did him wrong by creating this ultra virus that turns your brain into mush, basically. Writers of this episode didn't have to do that, but the fact that they did, I think, was to their credit. The fringe storyline of the mystery is all mirror images of this father and son dynamic and protecting family. And so that really does strengthen both storylines. And I love that this episode opens with a kid on his computer and he starts to see a weird video. And it's kind of like a, a, the ring kind of deal where it's like a bunch of weird images and stuff. And then using a technique that's very reminiscent of a technique that Wes Craven and Peter Jackson both used in Nightmare on Elm Street and the Frighteners, where this hand starts to come out of the screen. So it's taking this what would traditionally be like a practical effect, mixing it with digital and the hand grabs the kid's face and melts his brain. And I love that this is some weird Stephen King, David Cronenberg type shit right off the top of the episode where technology turns bad and this kid's brain gets fried and we have to figure out how is this possible and as it happens, we start to connect the dots and realize that this is not a random sequence of events, but it is targeted revenge. And I like that none of this really is is as serious as some of our previous threats, because this is a guy targeting people, but we treat it as if it is, you know, a, a pandemic level threat. and seeing the lengths that Peter will go to to try and get information by reaching out to people from his past. Olivia gets a personal stake in it as the episode goes on because she gets targeted and Ella, who was only added to the cast a couple episodes ago, is immediately put into danger. But it added more of a, a personal dynamic to something that felt more broad in terms of the main threat. What are you thinking when... We see these brains get melted and these horrible murders. And then uh, Olivia's nephew, or Olivia's niece is next up. I did think that that was a sort of look that I think that was a gimme from the writers to the people who may have not liked the introduction of Olivia's family. I think that was a writer's way of trying to explain to us, look, they're important. We're going to put them in danger. I think this story on the surface is really light. Like, I think that the writers in the room came up with the, came up with this subplot of Grams and Walter first, and then they had to put something on top of that. And they chose the brain melting thing through the computer. This story feels like it's missing one more punch. Like if they would have incorporated some of the main threads of this season and possibly of the series, I think this episode would have played better for me or it would have, it would have felt more like a complete meal rather than an appetizer. Yeah, I totally agree. I think that there are parts of this episode that really worked, but in terms of the episodes that we've watched so far, I would rank this lower only because, yeah, there are some good ingredients here, but they don't add up to to much. But I still do, you know, the visuals of the, the computer hand reaching out and the brain melting is cool. The guy who is the one doing it, played by Chris Bauer from The Wire and True Blood, Andy Belfleur. Um, like, I, I like that guy. He's a great character actor. He's currently on heels with Stephen Amell, and he is amazing on it. And we get good actors, but this story didn't have as much juice as some of the other, you know, mystery of the week kind of things. And then the fact that we we added in Olivia's niece, her sister, a couple of weeks ago, we immediately put the niece in danger, which felt kind of like, you know, this race against time. But I never thought she was actually going to be in danger because I'm like, we didn't add a kid two weeks ago to then kill the kid in a week and a half later. And then I get frustrated 
when they're trying to make a love triangle between Peter, Olivia, and the sister. And I'm like, come on, we're just starting to to get the shades of the Peter Olivia relationship. And now we're throwing Rachel into the mix and having her and Peter directly flirt. I didn't really love that at all. And the other week we brought back the sexual harassment guy to investigate team fringe, which bothered me to begin with. And as he, now luckily they address my main concern about this storyline in this episode, because as this guy was going around, like, I'm going to take Fringe down because these guys are spending too much money and they're unauthorized. And I'm thinking, isn't he supposed to be Broyles' best friend? Why is he trying to ruin the division that Broyles is now running? But luckily, there is a scene late in the episode where Harris and Broyles do have their showdown. And Broyles says, fuck off, dude. Like, we are doing something important here. And if you're going to make me choose, like, you or Dunham as of right now, like Dunham is who I'm backing. So I liked that the whole time this guy has been back and he's been trying to take down fringe. I'm like, wouldn't his best friend, Philip Broyles kind of say like, Hey man, don't mess with my job. So I liked that. We did get that scene late in the episode where, you know, Broyles sticks up for Olivia to this guy that, has just done nothing has added nothing for me on the show so far and just been like a a time waster. That guy is such an asshole. I mean, you know, he's a great character actor and I, and I guess what people, I still don't remember his name from last week, but he's a great character actor. I think that he's just an asshole. And I think that he is in here just to stir up the tension a little bit more than usual. My favorite part of this episode is when Peter and Olivia are driving to a certain place. And I've, I've mentioned, I've, I've hinted at the scene er, in, in my earlier comments, but I like how Olivia is feeling so comfortable with Peter now that she feels the need to pry and she feels the need to convince Peter that his father is insane. This has been well established, but she thinks that he should give his father a little bit more respect, basically. And I really, really enjoyed that. And this scene directly ties into the little, you know, thematic thread that goes throughout the back of this episode that I think, like I said before, is better than the main story of this episode. Yeah, it it all is going back the main thematic thing is you know family protects family and sometimes even if it's wrong you just do what you can to make sure that those that you love don't get hurt and in this episode we see massive extremes of it on either end with you know the the son who's protecting the father who is murdering and then just the son who's protecting the father from emotional pain so i do think that that was handled well and definitely one of the more interesting thematic parts of this batch But this episode overall, not my favorite. One that I enjoyed a lot more is episode 13, The Transformation, written by J.R. Orsi and Zach Whedon, directed by Brad Anderson again. And this one, we return to a plane. And in Fringe World, anytime we start an episode on a plane, you know shit is going to go down. But I don't know if anybody thought we were going to see a dude turn into Sonic the Hedgehog and go berserk. So what did you think of this opening with the transforming guy on a on a plane who's begging for tranquilizers? It's the old from, you know, the horror movie trope of the Wolfman. Lock me up. Lock me up. And people not wanting to do it. Yeah, well, first, I feel that I should mention that I'm terrified of going on planes. So this doesn't you know, quench my thirst and doesn't convince me that planes are the safest way to travel. This definitely does not do that. But the one thing that I was wondering throughout this entire episode um, is that, number one, this guy knows or he doesn't know that he's been dosed by accident, okay? But if he has an inkling that he's been dosed by accident, why put himself 
in a big metal box high above the ground. Unless he didn't know that it was dust. But if he did, then why would he get on the plane? I think the main reason why he got on the plane is because the plane is a big giant MacGuffin to introduce everything else. But with that being said, I did love his insistence to find tranquilizers and to find sedatives and shit like that. And I love the fact that these stupid fucking flight attendants didn't listen to him because if if they would have listened to him, maybe they would have been able to save the plane. But the fact that they didn't, was delicious. And I really like when he went into the bathroom and the first thing to fall out was his, his, his front tooth. And it was great. And I love when he went to the floor and you saw his back open up and the, and the spikes start to come out. That was goddamn awesome. But I think the best shot of this opening is when you see the soccer mom, go back to her SUV, open up the back, put something in the back and close the back door. And there you see the plane flying low and then all of a sudden, in the nearby distance, and then credits. That was just awesome. Yeah, that was great. And I think the whole opening sequence is really fantastic because I love the the panic when the guy the guy goes to the bathroom and takes a COVID test. And we're watching this now. And I'm like, oh, uh-oh. And, he's, and he runs out. And when he's trying to convince them and he's telling them, like, look. Get all the tranks. I'm going to be in the bathroom. I'm locked in. And it's just like a ticking clock. Like we know something bad is going to happen, but we don't know what. So I love that. Then we get this awesomely gruesome moment where, yeah, his teeth are falling out and he's transforming. And it feels like, like an American werewolf transformation. And I just thought that was so cool. And even then when he's in the bathroom and then we cut back to the, the flight attendants talking to each other. And they're like, well, I guess somebody should go back there and check. And then he bursts out the door and starts smashing shit. And I thought just the way that they do that, the whole opening was so intriguing and so fun in a horror movie kind of way. Because it was it was a creature feature and a transformation scene that was gross and fun. And then we get into the meat of the episode where we are figuring out a lot of our mythology involving John Scott. And this is the episode that by the end, it feels like we are kind of putting the John Scott stuff mostly to rest because as the episode goes on, we find out massive dynamic comes clean and says like, we, we had his body here. He is. We've, we've done everything we can with the memories we were able to get. We've hit a wall and like, because he's just a husk of a thing, like this is kind of as far as we can go with this guy. And then we do have Olivia revisiting memories. And again, everyone is telling her when she's in these memories, you can't interact, but somehow she finds a way to interact in the memories. So that's stuff that we have established earlier. And now we're exploring it much more fully as we are taking this John Scott and the Olivia having his memories storyline and finally playing it out because they need the information for this high stakes moment to make sure that they can apprehend the people that they need so that this doesn't spread everywhere, doesn't get out of hand, doesn't go beyond their capabilities and we have parts that are kind of like a spy espionage thriller where Peter and Olivia are in the, the hotel room and they're trying to make the buy and do the setup and not be found out. And we have that Olivia in the tank, in the memories. So we're getting a couple of different genres mashed up here. The creature feature, the espionage thriller, and it's all working very well. What are you thinking as we're mashing up kind of these different tones and different different styles into this one episode where so much is going on. I loved it. I'm I'm going to I'm going to preface this by saying I'm having a really really big problem with one of the TV shows that I'm watching right now because I feel that they're just throwing shit at the wall and they're not sending a proper story. So every time or every week that we see Fringe, I'm like, "Oh, thank God. Proper storytelling, proper plotting. It makes sense. It's fun." It's innovative, it's mashable, like this episode is, 
But I love how they, I mean, we mentioned that we thought that the last episode needed something a little bit more. And I appreciate that in this episode, they wanted to do a little bit of this and a little bit of that, but they cooked it just right, that it makes all the sense in the world. My favorite thing in this episode was the discovery. First of all, I loved when Massive Dynamic finally came clean with all their shit. And I love when Olivia, a little later on in the episode, discovers that John Scott and his two compatriots, the guy who died on the plane, and and another guy that they meet later, have these discs in their hands. And I love the way that, at this point, Olivia is so desperate. Well, she's not desperate, but she is... She is really used to working on fringe cases now. And I love the way that she just says, I want you to cut in his hand or I want you to put me in the tank. Olivia is not concerned with doing paper prop, uh, proper paperwork anymore. She even comes clean to Charlie about being connected with John Scott psychically. And I thought that that was really interesting because I thought that she would have kept that from him a little bit longer. But I am happy that she finally opened up to him about that. And in true agent French, this fashion, he's like, uh, okay. I'm not really sure. I like, I have, I, I like, I don't know what to say, but you're my friend and I want to go with it. Um, you know, but I, I, I thought this episode was really, really a blast from start to finish. I loved it so much. Yeah. And I do love that. As you mentioned, the discs in the hand is something that comes back because the first transformation guy has one. We realize that John Scott was part of a group with this guy. And the other guy is this guy named Hicks, who they realize is going to transform. And they have like a ticking clock where they've got to get information from him because they want to know what's going on with this. They discover it's a designer virus that transforms you. And so as they are digging into the mystery and they realize this virus is going to be up for sale. That is part of the information that Olivia has to get out of John's memories is who's involved in the sale, where the sale is going down. And as we're, you know, we've got the guy who's transforming and we're trying to sedate him and he doesn't give us all the information we need. So you're like, Oh motherfucker. And then Olivia gets most of the information but not all of it. So that makes the final hotel scene where the buy is going down and the people are trying to make sure that they're in the room with the right people more tense. But I love that we are connecting. So John Scott is part of this group. Now we still, they addressed it in the last episode where, or maybe it was this one where the sister finds the engagement ring and starts to ask Olivia, like, what's this about? And she says, look, he was a traitor. And Olivia, even through all of this, as more is coming to light, she's still not convinced that he was doing anything legit good. She still believes that this was all some traitorous plot. So we're trying to shine a light on John Scott's true motives and figure out if there's more at play. And with this designer virus, and the possibility that it could be going global, we still have a few questions, but I love that we're bringing up all of the questions we had about John Scott and trying to address them at least peripherally in some sort of way as we move forward now that Massive Dynamic has come clean about having him and and what that all entailed. But I did like that when they're having their almost a Mexican standoff in that hotel room, Luckily, they save the day and supposedly everything will hopefully be mostly OK because they get out of there alive, which is the the win in that moment. But we do find out that, you know, Olivia, by the end, has a better grasp on what she thinks is the truth. And even though she can't officially exonerate John Scott for what was going on, she knows the truth of everything. And that will be enough to at least help her 
put some of this to rest. What are you thinking as we're getting more of this John Scott story and figuring out what he was actually doing? I was really surprised that they didn't, you know, make him a bad guy and they didn't keep him that way. I'm really surprised that they went sort of above and beyond to give us hats in the ground to sort of to lead us down this road and to make us question whether or not the loyalty of John Scott was to be fully believed or not. But then on further inspection, I'm like, I'm watching a bad robot TV show. So this is what they do. So it, so it totally makes sense that they would do a story plot like this. And at the time, Anator and the actor who plays John Scott were married. So maybe their real life uh, relationship played into him being a bigger part of the show as season one went on. I don't know if that was indeed the case, but maybe that uh, maybe that played into the storytelling in some sort of way. Do you have any more questions about John's loyalty or do you think that it's pretty much set in stone at this point that he was a good guy and he wasn't a bad guy after all. So I think as everything's playing out, we're still trying to catch up and figure out if we can believe it all. But the final scene where Olivia, after she is pretty sure she knows that he was working with these people to infiltrate them and stop this from happening. And she goes back to the lab and says, I got to go in the tank again. And Walter says, it's not a good idea. And every time you go in to John's memories, you're disconnecting from him. Your connection is weakening. And if you do it one more time, because your brain is finally course correcting and purging his memories from your brain, if you do it again, it'll probably be the last time we can do it. And she says, I have to do it. And they meet on the dock by the lake. And they have that final moment, which is in Olivia's mind. So we can't take it at 100% face value. But because this is fringe, we can believe that this is exactly what her and John's interaction would be like if he were still alive. And she says, I'm sorry that I doubted you. And he says, it's fine. Like, I couldn't tell you what was actually going on, but I was trying to do the right thing. And then... There's a thing with the ring and they hug and they basically say their final goodbyes in that moment. And then John disappears and Olivia is on the dock by herself. And then we just cut to her in the tank and she's got like a smile on her face. So it's it's trying to put that closure on this storyline, partly because. I don't know if they thought that this was going to be more like a more of a focus and they're wrapping it up early. Or if this is exactly, they wanted half of the season to be this thread. And now we're wrapping the John Scott stuff up so that we can transition into something in the back nine. But it, it feels like this was the main story that they had plotted out when they would have sat down and charted the beginning of the season, because in general, when shows like this get greenlit, usually they get picked up for back in the day, at least for a 13 episode order. And then if you're lucky, you get the back nine. Um, So the fact that this is episode 13 and we're wrapping up the John Scott storyline feels like if they were only going to get to make an X amount of episodes without that back end pickup, at least we would have got the emotional closure of that loop. So I appreciated that they did that. And now we can go on to something more with the breadcrumbs that that we have been laying into these episodes that haven't been the main focus. I am so happy you brought that up because I didn't consider that at all. Like the entire Olivia and John Scott relationship now to me, based on what you just said, feels like hats on the ground, but hats on the ground that the writers left there on purpose because they needed the first, what, nine episodes to hit really hard so they can get the rest so they can get the second half. So I really appreciate that you uh, said that because to me, the whole Olivia and John relationship from the start really, really felt like a stepping stone to get what I really cared about, 
the the Olivia and Peter relationship, but just based on what you said, in a way, their relationship serves as a good like mini movie to the first half of Fringe. And if Fringe would have gotten canceled after those first nine, we would have gotten a semi-complete story. I mean, sure, we would have had hats on the ground all over the place, but I think that we as a fan base would have been satisfied with that relationship. If that's the only relationship, if that's the only relationship that Olivia ever had, that was very astute of you, Matt, not to say that you don't wow me every week, but I really like that. Every once in a while, there can be a gem there. Where do you think we're going to go in the second half of the season? Do you think that it's good? Just going to like, like they're going to hit the gas and we're going to get, uh, mythology up to yin yang as we as we as we go to the second half so i think that if i were to guess having not seen it i would assume it was actually going to be the opposite that the last nine would be more mystery of the week with a few of those things spread in but knowing also that this is a jj abrams production you realize that even if we are sticking to the mystery of the week stuff for this remainder, we are probably going to pay off a lot of the weird references to Peter's past that we have set up. We still have the observer popping up in most episodes and we haven't addressed that in full since episode four. So you do feel like there is a lot more on the table. We've got our main villain who escaped still on the loose ZFT a lot of that stuff that hopefully will come back. So I would say, I think it's, they have found their rhythm where they've got that 70, 30 split. This episode was much more mythology than it was necessarily mystery of the week. But the first episode we talked about was still that 70, 30 mystery of the week mythology. Whereas this one was, you know, 30, 70, um, but I think that they're still going to hit that same ratio for much of this. Anybody who has seen Fringe before knows that later seasons, they go basically 100% serialized mythology. But we're still at a point where we're trying to get people to find the show and latch on to it in a way that is still accessible if you missed the first 15. It was something that Fox was concerned with, but only to a point where they realized now we're at a point where you're either on the train or you're not, and we, we aren't making any stops for those who want to get on. And you know, um, we still haven't seen somebody by the name of William Bell, so he might come or he might not come. Who knows? So we definitely have a lot more on the table that they haven't addressed, but it does feel like the John Scott stuff got a nice big bow put on it by the end of this one. Next week, if you are watching at home with us, we will be talking about episode 14, Ability episode 15 inner child that's the homework if you guys like what we're doing here or if you don't you can let us know on twitter at jj universe 815 or tweet using the hashtag radio 815 past episodes are of course available anywhere you're listening to this whether it be spotify apple youtube you can check out the past episodes as well if you like what we're doing please like follow subscribe share Whatever it is, just do it. We appreciate it. If you want to talk to me on Twitter, I am at Matt Crandall. Marcelo is also on Twitter. Where can the people reach you? I'm at CreekFanatic88. That'll do it for this week. Thanks so much for listening. Until next week, Radio 815 over and out. Radio 815 is a Balloonhead Productions presentation in association with Killer Newt Productions.